Welcome to session number 24 of Biblical Backgrounds. I'm Dr. John McMath, joined here today by my friends in uh, Italy and the Philippines. Uh, and I'm uh, seeing everybody's picture here. Welcome. Good to, good to see you all. Uh, today we'll be looking at uh, backgrounds that help us to see the the tremendous accuracy of uh, the book of Acts. Uh, well, particularly, we're going to be looking at Athens and Rome. Uh, and uh, both of these cities uh, were uh, major places during the New Testament. Athens was on the decline, but Rome was at its peak. Uh, Paul went to both of these places. Uh, we're also going to uh, spend a little time in Corinth. Yeah, again, I'm looking at my map here, and we're, I'm going to show you the Corinth material as well. It's surprising how much is left uh, and how much relates to the New Testament. So without, uh, without waiting around, let's move on to, let's see if we can do this here. There's the correct one. And it's up. Okay, uh, we're going to start off with Athens. Uh, this shot has a, a, a bit of a backstory to it. About 30 years ago, uh, I took my first trip to Greece uh, along with um, a group of uh, recent high school graduates and, uh, and their leaders. So I had about 15 kids, something like that. Uh, and we started in Greece and took the ferry boat to uh, Israel from, uh, from Greece. And uh, that first trip to Athens, we ended up uh, missing a flight and getting into town very late and uh, having trouble getting our uh, 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 getting our van, uh, it, it was it was not a good beginning to the trip. Uh, so we ended up taking a, a bus into uh, Athens, uh, and uh, it was a uh, one in the morning. We ended up in Syntagma Square, the the civic center of uh, Athens, uh, and it, this is not a nice place to be in the middle of the night. Uh, but I knew there was a, a hill not too far away with a monastery on top, uh, an old ruined monastery, uh, where we could probably spend the rest of the night. Uh, so I hiked, uh, hiked the group through uh, sleeping downtown Athens in the middle of the night. And we ended up on top of a place called Mount Lycabatis. I uh, rolled out our sleeping bags and got... Uh, several hours of sleep on top of this um, middle of town uh, mountain. When the sun came up about four, uh, I woke up. Being a little older than the kids, I tend to wake up early anyway. So it was about 4 a.m., maybe 4.30 in the morning. Uh, and I looked around and there about, oh, maybe a kilometer away, uh, was this view. That's uh, the Acropolis in uh, Athens at sunrise uh, overlooking the Saronic Gulf. And this, it, it, was a, uh, it was a breathtaking moment. Uh, just the realization that that Acropolis with uh, the Parthenon and the other temples uh, is uh, something that Paul would have seen. Uh, the uh, recognition that here is a place that has stood for uh, 2,500 years, 3,000 years for uh, parts of the uh, Acropolis uh, as the capital of an empire, then the capital of a city, and then the capital of a, a provincial uh, uh, area, now the capital of an uh, uh, independent nation of Greece. Uh, so that's a that's a good place to start. We'll start off with the harbors because uh, we know that uh, when Paul came into Greece, he came in through a harbor. Uh, we know that uh, on his uh, second journey, he ended up in Athens. Uh, he came from Thessalonica by sea, 
and arrived at one of the ports of Athens. Uh, uh, the exact location is in question. There are several possibilities. Uh, the closest natural harbor is a place called Phaleron. It's about oh, seven kilometers outside of town to the south. Uh, there's a local tradition uh, that uh, tells us that Paul landed in the resort town of Glyphida, uh, which uh, has no particular reasons to favor it, except it's got several nice hotels uh, and a uh, nondescript Byzantine church ruin that claims to be the place where Paul landed. Uh, there's, uh, there's no evidence to support that. Uh, the most likely place for Paul to have come into uh, the Athens area was through the port at Piraeus. Uh, Piraeus has been the uh, harbor of Athens since classical times. Uh, and, uh, today, it's a, it's a modern industrialized port with all the trimmings. Uh, it, uh, it's hard to tell the difference between Piraeus and Manila and Los Angeles, frankly, the ports all look the same. Uh, and uh, this is likely the place that Paul came in. Uh, and uh, this photograph is taken from a ferry boat uh, that uh, is on its way out of uh, Piraeus, uh, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, the city of Athens is very well known. Uh, it, Archaeology has given us a, a vivid picture of Athens from the time of Paul. Uh, there are uh, thousands of inscriptions uh, found in the uh, Agora region. Uh, and stratigraphic excavation has been done on numerous structures. There's widespread construction work for the Olympic Games back in 2004 uh, that uh, led to uh, literally uh, thousands of uh, specific finds, uh, most of which uh, were salvaged very quickly, uh, but some of which uh, have, uh, have led to uh, new displays. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge. Uh, Athens in New Testament time uh, was a city from which we could say the glory had departed. Uh, it had once been the capital of an empire uh, from the time of Alexander the Great uh, through the time of the, uh, uh, the four governors of the four provinces of the Greek empire. Greece actually had a kind of an empire uh, the, the Greeks were never particularly good at um, taking over the world and running a massive empire. Uh, their tradition of uh, personal independence, uh, eleutheria, uh, the, the notion of liberty, the free men ought to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, not because they're ordered to do it by an authoritarian government. Uh, the Greeks have always been uh, a um, freedom-loving people, an individualistic people. Uh, and, uh, uh, it's that background that lays the foundation uh, for much of the success of Western civilization. So it's a fairly important thing, but it also meant uh, that uh, Athens had a very brief time in the sun as the seat of an empire. Uh, and, uh, and they weren't able to hold it together. Uh, the, uh, the Romans uh, around 146 BC, uh, took over uh, what was left of the Greek Empire by that time. In some places there were uh, there were battles, uh, but in most places uh, the the Greeks simply agreed that the Romans could move in and take advantage of the geography. Uh, I like to think of uh, uh, the 
uh, the Romans as being a, a large economy size uh, Greek empire. Uh, the Romans uh, adopted the Greek language, they adopted Greek architecture, uh, they, uh, uh, they took up most of the elements of Greek religion. Uh, uh, Greek philosophy formed the foundation uh, for the rationality of uh, Roman thinking. Uh, so uh, Greece became, and the Greek empire became, over a period of about 150 years, a wholly owned subsidiary of Rome. And that meant that, uh, uh, that Athens, once the capital, was by the first century, by the time of Paul, a provincial backwater, a small university town where people argued about ideas and basked in the memory of grander times. Uh, these great monuments that we see today uh, were all built uh, well before New Testament times. Uh, and uh, the, the Greece of Paul's day uh, was no longer um, no longer the uh, the garden spot of the world, <laughs> but it was a it was a bustling city. Uh, Paul's visit apparently came during a Roman building surge. Uh, uh, it's interesting. We find no fewer than ninety four altars to the emperor Hadrian. Uh, which, which is really quite amazing. Uh, Hadrian is about the time of Paul. Uh, so we, we see it, you know, an altar to an emperor. That's a, 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 that's a purely political thing. Okay, let's go up on top of the hill. Here's the Acropolis. I showed you the broader view of the Acropolis uh, earlier. Here's, uh, here's a view a little closer up. Uh, the term Acropolis uh, means uh, literally the high city. Uh, and it was originally the citadel for the old Greek city-state of Athens. Uh, the citadel is the military position, the last ditch defensive position in the middle of town. Uh, would have had walls around the outside and so on. Uh, as time went on and kings came and went, the Acropolis became the core of quite a substantial city. Uh, and the kings began to build temples to their chief gods and monuments to their outstanding achievement. Uh, by 500 BC, uh, the Acropolis was crusted over with all kinds of monumental architecture. Most of that today has fallen into ruin and is simply gone reused in other projects, although we find uh, the footings and the places where footings would have been for buildings all over uh, the Acropolis. Uh, archaeology in this place is an ongoing project. The temples on the Acropolis were dedicated to an astonishing array of deities. Uh, the idols could be seen everywhere. In Paul's time, the Acropolis no longer had room for all the idols, and temples were spilling out into every quarter of the city. Uh, uh, Paul saw a city given over to pagan fertility cults and to the more recent mystery religions. Uh, in uh, uh, Acts 17, one of Paul's fav uh, famous lines in his defense on Mars Hill is, men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. <laughs> okay, they, and he could tell that because there's just altars everywhere. And, and it wasn't good religion. Uh, the fertility cults of Greece uh, and of Rome were not really much different than the cults of Babylon and Canaan and Egypt. All the fertility cults have the, the same characteristics. The names of the gods and goddesses were different, but their role in the world was the same. They, these gods and goddesses represent the created order, the, the material universe in all of its parts. Uh, and what was forgotten in all of this was the one true God who had created all the rest. Uh, fertility worship involved a, a, 
a variety of debased practice. Fertility religion is really not a uh, not a very pretty sight. Uh, some of the most popular gods required a sacrifice. So if you were to make a sacrifice to Zeus, for example, the the uh, chief of the gods, uh, you would uh, you would bring an animal for the sacrifice, and just like with the uh, 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 the offerings, the Thanksgiving offerings, and the praise offerings at the uh, the temple in Jerusalem, a portion of the animal uh, was burnt on the altar. A portion was kept for the priests so that they would have food, uh, and a portion was returned to the uh, worshiper. Uh, so the purpose of the sacrifice was to provide food. It was it was the meat for a barbecue. Uh, they were they were going to go out for a tailgate party, and everybody wanted to make sure there was plenty of meat. There were some of the gods, like Dionysius, who required a sacrifice of wine or strong drink, and this was a this was a similar uh, uh, process. Uh, worshippers would go up to the temple. They would pay a certain amount of money for uh, as much uh, wine or strong drink as they wanted. Uh, a portion of that would be poured out on the altar. A portion would be given to the priests, and the rest would be kept for the party. Uh, if it sounds like uh, going out uh, for a night on the town, that that's pretty close. Uh, so we're going to have plenty to eat and we're going to have plenty to drink. As long as we've got plenty of meat and plenty to drink, uh, how about if we, we rent a room uh, and uh, find some, uh, uh, some ladies to entertain us? Um, <laughs> after a night on the town worshiping, the pagan crowd might well go looking for even more religious opportunities up at the sacred brothel. Uh, and I use the term, I know that's an offensive word, but I use the term uh, with precision. The temples to Venus, Aphrodite, or Athena were places where prostitutes in a wide variety of specialties were available. Um, you could get the impression, uh, studying pagan religion, that for ancient man, the meaning of life could be summed up in the motto, uh, let's uh, eat, drink, and go out and find us some women. Uh, paganism is, is, not, is not nice uh, and uh, not genteel. Uh, the... Um, uh, uh, the world into which Paul brought the gospel uh, was a world in which massive expense had been given over to the single-minded pursuit of pleasure in the name of religion. Uh, Athens is a good sign of them. Uh, the greatest temple on the uh, Acropolis is the Parthenon. And uh, this is uh, two images on the right side of this shot show the Parthenon. Lower right shows the Parthenon from a, a, a distance, uh, then uh, a close up uh, on top. This was dedicated to the virgin goddess Athena, also called Queen of Heaven. Uh, it's a uh, Fascinating that Athena, the um, uh, protectress of Athens, uh, is thought of as a virgin. Uh, and she's also uh, thought of as uh, having a special place in heaven. Uh, later on, we're going to see uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, being spoken of with much the same language. Uh, there's, uh, there's something unsettling about that uh, uh, because the, the worship of Athena was anything but uh, a good thing. Um, at any rate, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the Acropolis or the, uh, the Parthenon. 
uh, the Parthenon from an architectural point of view is considered one of the most beautiful structures in the world, uh, just mathematically perfect. Uh, nearby is uh, a, a thing called the Erechtheion uh, with uh, pillars in the shape of uh, beautiful young goddesses. Um, again, you can imagine what went on there. Uh, and the entrance to the Acropolis area is through a big structure uh, that we call the propylon, literally the front porch. Uh, they, it's a monumental entrance and it symbolizes the separation of the gods who are up high from the world of men who are down below. Uh, all of this Paul would have seen uh, coming into this area, he would have uh, witnessed all of this. The, uh, the term agora uh, means uh, the public meeting place, uh, market, uh, the government area uh, for ancient Athens. All Greek cities had an agora uh, and Athens was no different. Uh, Paul went daily out into the marketplace uh, to meet people and share the gospel. Uh, there was apparently no synagogue in Athens. Uh, so Paul made his <coughs> presentations uh, out in the open. During the Greek era, the imperial era, <coughs> the Agora was a wide open space uh, devoted to political speeches and meetings and things. Uh, the Roman occupation made the political meetings unnecessary because the Romans took care of politics. Uh, so the Agora filled up with other sorts of buildings. In Paul's time, there were in this whole region, uh, a profusion of temples and public squares and stoas for orators and governmental buildings of various sorts. Modern, era, uh, modern Athens has been built over the top of the ruins of the Greek Agora. Uh, and, uh, uh, there are bits and pieces to be found as other construction takes place. Uh, that's ongoing. Uh, part of the fun of visiting Athens is to see what they've uncovered since the last time. And there's always something more. Paul noticed among the pagan altars here, an altar to an unknown God. Uh, this is in Acts 17.23. Uh, Paul was not the only ancient traveler to notice such uh, altars. There's a traveler by the name of Pausanias in 150 AD who noticed numerous altars to unknown gods. In 1208 AD, a pope named Innocent III uh, traveled to Athens and claimed to have found an altar to an unknown god. Uh, and uh, that's that's hard to confirm. In 1909, a German scholar named William Dorpfeld uh, cleared the sacred area at Pergamum uh, and found an altar to an unknown god uh, in Greek. Uh, that one remains the only altar to an unknown god that we've we actually still have. Uh, but it seems quite likely that these altars were all over uh, Athens. Uh, Paul says, that which you worship in ignorance, I now proclaim to you. And he went on to proclaim the gospel. Uh, that, was a, that was the introduction to the gospel, uh, a, a kind of an opportunity that sometimes we find in uh, uh, in pagan places. Uh, this is the Areopagus or Mars Hill, uh, the, the hill where the god Mars uh, was uh, worshiped. At one time there was a temple there. Uh, and uh, the tradition has it that in times of distress, the men of Athens would join together on Mars Hill. Uh, and uh, uh, discuss whether or not to go to war and uh, what had to be done next. Uh, this is the spot where Paul was taken uh, before the uh, 
uh, the Committee of State Security, a kind of governing body for the city. And the, uh, the meeting place uh, isn't specified, but it's uh, most likely uh, here on Mars Hill. This is a, a short walking distance from the Acropolis uh, and uh, easy to get there. Uh, one of the men who per heard Paul speak on Mars Hill that day was a member of the Areopagus Committee named Dionysius. And uh, he is mentioned in Acts 1734. He became the first Bishop of Athens. He was martyred under the Roman Emperor Domitian and uh, was canonized by the Orthodox Church and is today regarded as the patron saint of the city of Athens. Uh, so pretty neat thing, uh, really. Uh, we've, we've, got, um, we've got a direct connection to antiquity here uh, in, uh, in the name of uh, the one character. So here's Paul's, uh, Paul's route. This is, uh, this is going to be his uh, 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 third missionary journey. And again, he starts out in Antioch, uh, dates here from 54 through 58 AD. This is the last big journey that Paul is going to take. Uh, he's going to uh, uh, retrace his steps through uh, first the churches of Galatia uh, and then uh, Western Asia Minor. Uh, he will end up uh, heading uh, north again through Troas, uh, through uh, Philippi, uh, then on to Thessalonica. Uh, and interestingly, on his third journey, he doesn't bother stopping in Athens, uh, ends up uh, going directly past Athens all the way to Corinth, uh, which is interesting. Uh, we notice on this trip that um, uh, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians while he was in Ephesus on the way out. Now, uh, when we were studying New Testament together, uh, I mentioned that actually Paul had written four Corinthian epistles. What we have are the second and the fourth. Uh, and so the first and the third uh, didn't make the cut for belonging to the New Testament. Um, those of us who are historians really would like to have them, but they're gone. Uh, and we have the second and the, uh, or, and the fourth letters. Uh, First Corinthians, the second letter, was written from, uh, from Ephesus uh, around 54 AD. Second Corinthians, which is actually the fourth letter, was written from Philippi. And then Paul followed that up with a trip directly to uh, Corinth itself. Uh, Corinth is obviously uh, a, a strategic center as far as uh, Paul is concerned. Uh, Paul felt the need uh, to develop the church at Corinth. And uh, as, you, as we can tell by reading the letters that Paul wrote, Corinth had some significant problems. <laughs> There's also a trip uh, into Illyricum that uh, is mentioned in passing in Romans uh, 15. Paul wrote Romans from Corinth, uh, and we have no real knowledge of um, what happened on that trip. Would have been interesting. On his way back uh, along this trip, Paul stopped again outside of Ephesus, uh, a brief stop, a place called Miletus, uh, before heading back to uh, Jerusalem. And in Miletus, Paul famously met with the Ephesian elders. Uh, important meeting and important principles there uh, for us to, uh, uh, to learn from. Okay, so let's do a little bit with Corinth. Uh, Corinth is a really, really important city. I'm just going to start right off here. This is a view from uh, right in ancient Corinth. I'm standing on the site of the Temple of Apollo and looking up at the 
uh, temple of Aphrodite, uh, what's called the uh, Acrocorinth, the high place of uh, Corinth. Uh, uh, that, that high ground dominates the city of Corinth. Corinth was located on the isthmus uh, between uh, the main part of Greece and the uh, Peloponnesian Peninsula. Uh, and this, this isthmus is only about five kilometers wide. Uh, in classical times, uh, there was a road, uh, that's this little road on the left, that went from one side of the isthmus to the other side of the isthmus and uh, ships uh, trades, uh, merchant vessels of various kinds would come to one side. They would unload onto wagons, uh, all of their stuff, uh, go to the other side and other ships would pick up those cargoes on the other side and carry them along. It was a much shorter trip than going all the way around the uh, Peloponnesian Peninsula. Um, in the 1800s, uh, Napoleon, actually dug a canal uh, through the uh, Corinth Isthmus. And we can see that on the right. Uh, it's um, uh, for engineering, it's one of the, the great feats of engineering in the whole world uh, and is well worth a visit. Uh, I've, uh, I've taken uh, college students here. <laughs> some of them were interested and some of them just didn't want to see one more historical site. Uh, it's kind of funny, uh, but uh, the, the canal is quite, uh, quite the famous thing. Uh, the emperor Nero actually tried to dig the canal uh, and uh, he was going to use Jewish slaves to do it. Uh, but uh, having gotten started, uh, the uh, uh, people around him talked him out of it, and uh, he ended up not uh, not digging the canal. He probably could not have succeeded. The view from the Acrocorinth, the top of that mountain with the uh, Temple of Aphrodite, uh, is uh, quite the amazing thing. You can look down at the Gulf of Corinth on the left, the Saronic Gulf is on the other side and leads over toward Athens. Uh, the uh, Diolkos is uh, at the head of the Gulf, right in the, the center there. Uh, immorality at Corinth is um, widespread. Uh, there, there's been quite a lot of scholarly attention over the last few years. Uh, scholars have been trying to understand exactly what was going on at Corinth. Uh, we know that uh, that there was a great deal of prostitution, at a great deal of drunkenness, at a great deal of misbehavior uh, in Corinth. Just reading the uh, the letters to the Corinthians, uh, we know that uh, Corinth was a seaport. Uh, it was a place where. Uh, uh, where transients, uh, visiting merchant seamen came from all over the world. They were far from home uh, and were looking for a good time. Uh, while the ship was being unloaded, they were waiting for another shipment to go out. They would spend their time and money in the town of Corinth. And much of the wealth of Corinth was dependent on that commercial enterprise. So what did they have? Uh, the Temple of Aphrodite uh, was uh, celebrated at the time uh, as uh, 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 providing uh, uh, numerous uh, temple prostitutes. Uh, the uh, Roman historian Strabo uh, attributes the great wealth of Corinth to the 1,000 prostitutes who were owned by the Temple of Aphrodite. Uh, other anecdotal comments of the era support the notion that prostitution was a big money maker in Corinth, uh, and I have no particular reason to doubt that. Uh, the uh, uh, imitative magic of uh, prostitution 
is a concept that goes all the way back to uh, uh, Babylonian and earlier fertility cults. Uh, if the, the worshipers and the priestesses engage in prostitution, uh, that's a way of encouraging the gods to make the earth fertile. It's, a, it's an inherently stupid idea, uh, but obviously very popular. Uh, we find it all over the ancient world. Uh, archaeological evidence for the immorality at uh, Corinth has been uh, not exactly widespread. We found the Temple of Aphrodite, or at least we found the footings of it. I don't have any pictures of that, but it's off to the right in this photograph. Uh, and in all likelihood, the prostitutes didn't work at the temple, but they were merely associated with it. On the lower slopes of the Acrocorinth, looking down this hill directly in front of us, uh, there was a temple complex devoted to Demeter, who's associated with good food and good wine. Uh, there are uh, 50 some odd large dining halls that were operated here uh, at uh, any one time. Uh, and those are just the ones that we found. These are like great big restaurants. Uh, the, uh, the feasting in New Testament times may well have taken place also in uh, open air or in tents. Uh, in uh, 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 such an agricultural fertility center, the dining and the uh, accompanying sexual activity uh, just seem to go together. Uh, the vision of uh, orgies with dancing girls and piles of grapes and whatnot uh, is uh, hard not to visualize. Hollywood is not far off the mark uh, when it comes to this. Uh, and Hollywood is also not far off the mark of uh, pagan evil <laughs> and sinfulness. That's the pagan world, the non-Christian world has this in common. This kind of culture is the context of Corinth into which Paul carried the gospel. It's the backdrop for understanding the Corinthian epistles. Uh, and it's the, the background for understanding just what a profound thing uh, Paul and the apostles uh, were bringing into the empire, and what a profound change actually took place here. When they turned the world upside down, this is, this is the world that was changing. Uh, the Isthmian Games should be brought up a little bit at Corinth. There's one of four sites in Greece uh, where uh, there, were, uh, there were what we call the Panhellenic Games. Uh, the other places were at Olympia, uh, at the foot of Mount Olympus, at uh, Delphi, which is very close to uh, Corinth, and at a place called Nemea, which is a port city. Uh, the local economies benefited greatly from games like this. They were probably held uh, during 51 AD while Paul was working in Corinth. Uh, and Paul very likely uh, took the opportunity of crowds attracted to the games to share the gospel. Uh, a lot of uh, times Paul uses uh, sporting analogies in his letters, talking about running the race and the athlete who competes in the game and the crown of glory and all of the rest of it. Uh, this, by the way, on the left is a statue of Apollo dressed up as an athlete. Uh, and that's the Temple of Apollo on the right. Uh, interestingly, there was a significant uh, Jewish presence at Corinth. Uh, Paul probably went to Corinth because it was a large cosmopolitan city, but also because of these, this large Jewish community. We found some Jewish inscriptions, uh, most from tombs, including uh, one bilingual Hebrew-Greek inscription. 
there's an inscription along this main street that you see in the foreground uh, found associated with some ruins nearby that says synagogue of the Jews. Uh, and uh, this was found fairly close to the forum. We don't know for sure which structure it was from, probably from a structure built in the second century. So after the time of Paul, there was a New Testament era synagogue uh, in this same general area. That's where Paul preached. Some of the religious architecture is, uh, is quite important. There's a temple of Apollo and an Asclepion. There's also a temple of Zeus, but the Asclepion and the temple of Apollo are the, the two major temples in Corinth. Uh, both were very important. The west side of town near the entrance Paul would have used, uh, we find the Asclepion. Uh, this was the medical center associated with the, the pagan deity Asclepios. Uh, and in the museum nearby, we see a large collection of uh, ceramic body parts. <laughs> These were used in the rituals of healing. Uh, uh, so you, you worship the gods by buying one, a, an ear or an eye or a leg or a foot or whatever hurt on you, uh, whatever wasn't working right. Uh, and uh, you would take that up to the Asclepia and, and uh, drop it in a box uh, to uh, demonstrate your, your praise of Asclepius. And afterwards, perhaps you would, uh, you would receive a healing. Um, it's uh, interesting, the same thing is still done today. And uh, that's, that's a whole nother story. I'll, I'll have to tell you that some other time. Uh, on a promontory near the uh, Lycaon Road stands the oldest temple in Greece. Uh, this is a Doric temple of Apollo. Uh, it looks over the forum and would have brooded over the Jewish synagogue. Uh, so this is the, uh, the temple of Apollo on the left. Uh, it uh, included a feature that we also find at uh, Delphi, uh, which is just a few kilometers away. That is an oracle. The oracle at Delphi is quite famous, but there was also an oracle at uh, Corinth. Uh, and it's very likely that the oracle at Corinth is older uh, because the temple at uh, Corinth is older. Uh, an oracle is a, a separate facility. It's a uh, kind of an add-on. It's a feature of, uh, of the temple. And inquirers could come to the, uh, the priests of Apollo and ask questions of the gods. Uh, so the king might come and say, uh, 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 what will be the outcome of my war with uh, Sparta, for example? Uh, and uh, the, the priests would go to one or more priestesses who worked in the, uh, the temple. The priestesses uh, would take that question and they would interpret the question to the gods in the form of uh, what we call ecstatic utterance. Literally, they would be speaking in tongues, uh, a, a kind of gibberish, well known in pagan worship. Uh, so the priestesses would speak to the gods in tongues. They would receive an answer from the gods and give that answer to the priests, again, in ecstatic utterance. The priests had the job of interpreting the tongue and giving the answer back to the, uh, the initial inquirer. Uh, so the practice of speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues was very well known at Corinth. Uh, it's significant uh, that uh, the Corinthians seem to have mistaken the, the practice that uh, is described at the day of Pentecost uh, for the 
the practice of ecstatic utterance at the temple of uh, Apollo. Uh, only Corinth in the New Testament churches, among the New Testament churches, had a problem with the abuse of the gift of tongues. Paul speaks of the gift of tongues, and by that he means the ability to share the gospel in a foreign language that is previously unknown. Uh, Paul had that ability, uh, and that requires an actual language. Uh, the, uh, the people of uh, Corinth uh, were not speaking in a foreign language. Uh, okay. Dum, 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 dum. Some commercial facilities are quite a large market area in Corinth. Uh, this arch on the left uh, covers up a storage building. Uh, the, uh, the lady on the right is standing along one of the main streets. Quite a lot of civic ar architecture. Uh, this particular one is the uh, water system. Uh, there, was a, uh, there were underground springs that uh, provided water for the city of Corinth. Uh, and uh, uh, maintained a 40 degree Fahrenheit temperature all year round. Uh, this was probably used, uh, we've, we found the channels uh, uh, throughout the city. This was used for the refrigeration of meat uh, at uh, the temples up and down the main street of Corinth uh, so that uh, meat offered to idols could be kept cold until it was uh, uh, time to uh, time to eat dinner. <laughs> All right, one last thing here. Well, a couple more from uh, Corinth. This one is interesting uh, because of the name Erastus. This is on the north side of town, into the hillside facing the uh, uh, Gulf of Corinth, and it's uh, uh, close to a theater uh, and uh, the. Uh, New Testament connection is uh, interesting. If this slab was found in 1929, and it identifies the builder of this pavement near the theater as Erastus the Idyll of Corinth, A-E-D-I-L-E, -E, Idyll. Uh, the Idyll is the uh, elected treasurer of the city. And normally a wealthy man. Paul sends greetings to Rome in Romans 16, 23, from Erastus the treasurer, uh, use, using exactly this language, the timing about 50 AD and the name and the position are exactly right. This is probably exactly the same man uh, who was mentioned by the apostle Paul. Then we're also told briefly about the Bema seat. Uh, Bema is a, uh, a tribunal or judgment platform. Paul made his defense before Gallio at this Bema. Uh, he stood before Gallio on this, this very spot. There's an inscription here that specifically identifies this structure as the Roman rostra. We get our English word rostrum or the Greek bema. Uh, and its construction was attributed to yet another treasurer of Corinth. Uh, Paul is eventually going to get to Rome. Uh, this on the left is one of my favorite pictures of Rome. It's uh, taken in the middle of the night from uh, the, uh, uh, the pedestrian area up above the subway station. Those of you who've been to Rome probably know where this was shot with the Colosseum there in the background. Uh, the shot on the right uh, is uh, one of the ancient gates uh, of the city of Rome. Uh, heading out uh, the Appian Way. This is the map of Paul's uh, final uh, journey, the journey to Rome uh, that's um, uh, depicted in Acts 23 through 28, where he left from Caesarea on a small boat, uh, got onto the larger grain ship, an Alexandrian grain ship at uh, Myra, uh, and they set sail from there to Crete, 
passing along the south side of Crete and could have spent the winter at Fair Havens. Uh, but instead, uh, the captain insisted on going on uh, and it didn't turn out well. The ship was wrecked uh, and eventually ran aground in Malta where the ship was destroyed. Uh, Paul went from Malta uh, on north through Sicily from the Syracusa to Reggio uh, and then by sea uh, up along the coast to Puteoli, which is just on the north side of Naples within sight of Pompeii. Interesting that Paul didn't stop at Pompeii. It was a big city and lots of places to see, but uh, he was on his way to Rome and uh, finally made it up to Rome. Rome is uh, very well known and very well preserved and lots and lots of stuff to see in Rome. Uh, the, uh, the forum of Rome is the, the beating heart of the city, uh, covered over with uh, public buildings and temples and uh, triumphal arches and all of the rest. Uh, this is uh, in an area, fairly low area, between the Palatine Hills and the Esquiline Hills. Uh, of th these two of the seven traditional hills of Rome. And this area uh, was originally a large open area for public business, uh, but eventually covered over with temples and monuments and the formal seat of the empire. Near this were the Colosseum, which is about uh, a kilometer from where I'm standing, and the Circus Maximus, uh, which is off to uh, my left about uh, two kilometers, as curl uh, today covered up by Vatican City. Many, many Christians lost their lives uh, in the Circus uh, or in the uh, Colosseum. Uh, during the Republican period down to 50 BC, uh, after Rome had replaced Greece as the leading power of the Mediterranean world, Roman architects were impressed with the Greek art and style. They used them in a lot of their construction. So numerous temple ruins are visible in the forum and date to the time of the Republic. Um, what you see there is heavily influenced by that Greek architectural style. Uh, during the imperial period from 50 BC to 200 AD, from the time of Augustus, during which Christ was born on, uh, Rome was greatly expanded. The city just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, lots of monuments. Uh, there's a uh, uh, one of the biggest monuments of the period from the time of Christ is this one called the Pantheon. It's a temple to all the gods uh, uh, during the time of Agrippa. Uh, just kind of an, uh, an amazing thing. It's a uh, 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 one of the biggest domes of antiquity. Uh, Augustus uh, boasted that he had found the city in stone and left it in marble. And uh, mostly that's true. By the time of Nero, there were nine aqueducts serving the city with lots of water. After the fire of 64 AD, uh, which Tacitus insists was caused by Nero himself, the city was rebuilt in even grander style. Nero built a 200 acre palace that he called the Golden House, which included a statue of himself as the sun, almost 120 feet high. Uh, quite a guy. This is the Arch of Titus, actually just a, one of the panels on the Arch of Titus. This was erected in 81 AD. Uh, and was erected in honor of the general who conquered Jerusalem in 70 AD. The inscription show the loot from the temple, including the golden menorah being carried away from the Jewish temple after its destruction. And other stuff, uh, this is Tivoli. Uh, I think I've shown you this picture before. 
which was uh, uh, built by uh, uh, Hadrian. Uh, bump, bump. This one is interesting. Uh, this is the uh, Mamertine prison. The picture on the left shows the church that was built over the top of it. Uh, and this is so, so true everywhere. Uh, once it was legal to build church buildings, uh, lots and lots of places that are significant in Christian history just got covered up with church buildings. Uh, so when you're, you're looking at these, you have to take the uh, tradition at face value and then go take a look in the basement you know, to see what there is to see. These shots on the, on the right uh, show uh, an underground prison. Uh, the entrance would have been through a hole in the roof. Uh, it's very likely that this was the place. Uh, it's uh, uh, Paul apparently spent two years under house arrest. Uh, it in, uh, at the end of the uh, book of Romans, but he was later uh, imprisoned again. We don't know exactly, uh, but he was uh, probably executed under uh, Nero. Uh, in the uh, early 60s AD after, after his trip to uh, Spain and maybe England. We don't know. Law, well, we don't know. But the harsh imprisonment was probably in this Mamertine prison. Uh, it, it's uh, uh, sobering to visualize the Apostle Paul surrounded by these stones. Uh, what else can we say about Rome? Uh, Rome did some really important things. Uh, Paul tells us in Galatians 4.4 4, that God sent his son uh, at exactly the right time, in the fullness of time. Uh, students of the New Testament should remember Rome not primarily for its architecture, as for its central role in providing the world with an empire of peace and prosperity, a single Greek language, which for 200 years provided a launching pad for the church. Never before or since has the whole world, or at least the whole civilized world, been at peace in quite the same way. There's never been anything like the Roman Empire. Uh, and that's not to say that the Roman Empire was wonderful people. They, they often weren't. But they provided the, uh, the nurturing seedbed uh, for the church. Without the Roman peace, it would have been very difficult for the church uh, to exist. That's where we're going to quit today. Uh, and uh, we're going to pick up next Wednesday uh, with a, a last lecture in the architecture or the archaeology of the New Testament text. We're going to look at manuscripts of the New Testament as a, one of the um, you know, important questions that we have to answer if we're going to be honest in uh, uh, discussing uh, biblical things is, can we really trust the text of the New Testament? Uh, what makes us think that this hasn't been altered irrevocably, that uh, lots and lots of errors have crept into the text? What makes us think that we've got it right? So we'll take a look at that next Wednesday. We'll see you all then. Uh, I look forward to, uh, to next Wednesday will be our last session in Biblical Backgrounds. Uh, and uh, we'll decide what to do from there. So God bless everybody. We'll see you again next week. I'm going to unmute us here. Let's see if that will work. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Uh, we you appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's been fun. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Bye-bye now. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.